I want to thank everyone for coming out on what has turned out to be a spectacular October evening. Uh, the weather could not have been better. So I want to welcome everyone uh, tonight, uh, Emory faculty, staff, students, people from the Atlanta metro area. We are delighted to have you here this evening. Uh, by way of introduction, I am Hazel Gold. This year, I am serving as the interim Judith London Evans Director of the TAM Institute for Jewish Studies. And we are excited for you all to be here this evening for what is an annual event, the Rothschild Memorial Lecture. And as we prepare to hear the remarks of our speaker tonight, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't bring to our memory uh, Janice Blumberg. Uh, she was a longtime friend and supporter of the TAM Institute, and she passed away at her home in, on February 21st of this year, having just celebrated her 100th birthday. She was nationally known as an author. She was a Jewish communal leader. She was a cultural influencer, I think before the term had even been invented. And Janice was especially beloved here in Atlanta, her home city. And we remember her as a key participant in and an interpreter of Atlanta's Jewish and civil rights past. And I will say that up until maybe three or four, well, just before the pandemic, Janice would attend these lectures and the dinner, and she was sharper than just about everyone in this room uh, in her early 90s. We miss her greatly, but this lecture series is a tremendous uh, memorial to her. And this evening would also not be possible without the very generous contributions of many, many co-sponsors here on campus. And I have to bring to mind the Center for Ethics, the Center for the Study of Law and Religion, a number of academic departments, and that includes history, Middle Eastern and South Asian studies, political science, and also religion. We also thank the Emory Libraries and the Carlos Museum, where we are tonight, as well as the Fox Center for Humanistic Inquiry, and finally, the Hightower Fund. And tonight, we are in for a real treat. Our speaker is Professor Sigal Ben Porat, who is from the University of Pennsylvania. And by way of just short information, she is the faculty director of the SNF Paideia Program for Dialogue and Civic Engagement. She is also the presidential professor of education at UPenn, and she has joint affiliations as well with political science and philosophy. She mentioned this evening that her uh, actual training was as a political philosopher. Uh, her recent books, and she is a prolific author, include Cancel Wars, published by the University of Chicago Press in 2023, Free Speech on Campus, put out by UPenn Press in 2017, and also Making Up Our Mind, which uh, was co-authored with Michael Johannick, also brought out by the University of Chicago Press in 2019. And just a real quick mention, uh, if you are excited to be here this evening, wanted to let you know as well, in case you haven't seen the publicity, we have another big TAM Institute event coming up on the evening of November 12th. Uh, we'll be featuring uh, a visiting artist who is with us on campus this semester, Orit Tashoma. And she will be speaking and performing, singing and rapping. And her uh, intervention, her performance that evening will be titled Soul Singing, an artist navigates Ethiopian Israeli identity. And I urge you to turn out for that. So we will turn the mic over now to Professor Ben Porat. And I wanted to thank you in advance. As you know, when you registered, we asked if you have a question, please submit it. 
So we got more questions than we can address, but we have a number of very interesting, some of them are overlapping questions that I've consolidated, and we'll be able to share those questions with Professor Ben Poirat at the end of her talk. So without going on and on, uh, I'm gonna turn the mic over to her, and as you can see on the screen, a uh, very up-to-date, very contemporary topic, campus speech about Jews after October 7th. Thank you so much, uh, Hazel, for this introduction. And thank you to Brent and to Paul for helping um, with my visit here. I really appreciate all of you uh, coming out uh, to this conversation, which uh, is not easy. So I'm just acknowledging that. Um, thinking about the boundaries of speech about Jews, uh, particularly in the last year. So, uh, and I'm noting, if you can see from the back, that all the images uh, in this um, presentation come from an art exhibit that I attended on October 23 last year uh, when I was in Jerusalem um, after October. And this was um, at Bezalel in Jerusalem, uh, uh, um, trying to resurrect the images of Southern Israel before October 7. So, okay. So for the plan today, I wanna say a few words about what brings me here, even though you already heard too much about me, but you'll hear a little bit more than I'm gonna do um, one minute of this potentially annoying teacher thing because I teach at an ed school. So I'm gonna take a moment to try and get you to think about what brings you here. Uh, and then um, I will talk uh, momentarily about October 7, about the continuities and breaks in the aftermath of October 7 on our campuses and then uh, we'll hope to devote some time to thinking about what we can do about the way um, uh, we hear people talking about Jews in the past year. Okay, so I'm going back. Here is me. Uh, I'm from Israel, as you understand. My family uh, still lives there. Um, I am a philosopher, as you also already know, and uh, my interest has long been uh, related to the democratic role of schools and universities. What is it that we need to do in order to prepare young people for their civic and democratic role? This is basically the scope of my work. And um, eight years ago, um, I was asked to chair the Committee on Open Expression at Penn, uh, which is a committee that's responsible for um, interpreting and applying the guidelines on open expression we have on our campus. And um, that was in, okay, so it's nine years ago, 2015. Uh, so a year later, it was 2016. And so uh, that meant that there was a lot of turmoil on campus related to the election, the aftermath of the election. Who knows, I'm speaking one week before the next one. From a Pennsylvanian to you all, I mean, here we are. Um, so, as I was chairing the committee and working with colleagues and students on issues that came up at the time, and it felt like it was a very tumultuous time then, um, I started realizing that we really need some more normative thinking, some more thinking about the goals of open expression on our college campuses and really to try to better understand the ways in which the one side's claim that we need to protect speech at all costs and the other side's claim that we need to maintain student safety and sense of inclusion even at the cost of restricting speech, that these two sides in fact 
at least at the time, um, have more in common than, um, uh, than they have uh, in contradiction to each other. And so the book I wrote, Free Speech on Campus, was really an effort to demonstrate the ways in which campuses can, in fact, in practice, protect both open expression and inclusion um, in their daily work with a very limited um, interruptions or concerns. And so, um, okay, that's the last tidbit about me. Two years ago, uh, I was a fellow at the Penn's Katz Center for Advanced Judaic Studies, and as I was telling some folks over dinner, um, I wrote a paper that tried to apply this thinking about open expression to the context of speech about Jews. So that's two years ago. And I wrote um, I, some work that was called Anti-Semitism, Anti-Zionism, and the Boundaries of Speech about Jews. And after I finished writing that, a few months later, October 7th happened, which really had me reconfigure some of my ideas, and that's what you will hear about today. Now, I, you know, most of the questions that we will hear today at the end of my talk are already planned, is what many of you have submitted. But I do want you to take a moment both to think to yourself and uh, for those of you who are game, uh, to chat with the person next to you for one minute about the question of what brings you here, what are some questions or concerns that you would like to make sure that we address during this conversation. So I'm going to be quiet for a moment, and you take the time to think or to chat, and then we'll continue. OK, so I would hope, I would hope that at least some of you have workshopped some question uh, that we will either have time to have you ask uh, during you know our time together or I'll stick around for a little bit and you can ask me and obviously uh, if you feel like uh, some of them are more pressing at any moment feel free to interrupt as or not interrupt to jump in uh, uh, as I go along okay so then we will talk about October 7 the continuities and breaks and we will talk about what we can do October 7, for me, like surely for many of you, was a, a, a day uh, of devastation. My parents are among the founders of Nachal Oz, which is one of the kibbutzim that were devastated. Um, uh, friends and family members have been uh, murdered or abducted on that day. And so uh, initially for me, uh, as for, I think, many people, this was uh, a day that was a complete break from the world as I understood it until then. Uh, in a certain ways, it remains um, sometimes, I remain unsure that it actually happens. So it's, it's, a, it's a day that is a complete aberration from my understanding of the world. Uh, but what I want to think about with you in the context of thinking particularly about what happened on college campuses then and since then is about the ways in which it was an aberration, but it was also a continuation of some of the things that we already knew and um, experienced and observed but maybe some of you, like me, have not paid as much attention or has not, have not felt as much concern about them prior to October 7. So let me talk about the breaks first. Uh, the stark acts that we have seen uh, very soon after October 7, for me, are clear breaks from how I understood my campus, my colleagues, my students, some of my colleagues, some of my students, and the context in which I uh, live in Philadelphia. 
Uh, very soon, two days after October 7, um, we had uh, 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 people congregating on campus and justifying October 7, uh, and in some instances celebrating it as uh, a moment of liberation for, uh, for Palestinian people. That for me was uh, a break. Uh, from how I understood the way that people, including people who are pro-Palestinian or are concerned about the occupation, et cetera, the way that they think about Israelis um, and, and what they have coming, so to speak. Um, mass protest around this issue, also an aberration. I mean, we've definitely seen attention to the topic, but we have not seen these numbers come out uh, with an interest in Palestinian liberation or in the Middle East more broadly or in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. So it was a topic of interest for some of us. I didn't see it bring out people to the streets in the same way. So these are um, also aberrations. And then in this context of the mass protest and some of the, as I know you've had on this campus as well, encampments and other um, uh, forms of protest, uh, demonstration, um, we started seeing uh, more concerned being, concerns being voiced regarding unequal rules or unequal enforcement of rules, meaning that some people, especially in the Jewish community, but also beyond, have started raising concerns about whether uh, uh, protests that are targeted against Israel or against Jews or both are treated differently than protests that are targeting or um, relating to other topics, other communities or other um, uh, events, uh, events that focus on other topics on campus. Public opinion on the topic is kind of in between a break and a continuation. You can see a very recent, this is from exactly one month ago, um, in a, uh, when we ask uh, Americans whether they sympathize more with Israelis or Palestinians or both in the conflict, you know, there is some movement, but we still see uh, also some levels of stability um, across public opinion. And one more thing, and that's of course related to, again, the election. It's the last time I'm mentioning it, but remember to vote. <laughs> um, uh, for young people, this is a survey from Circle at Tufts, uh, also from uh, a quite recently. Uh, the top issues that young people uh, up to age 30, am I right? No, 34, uh, care about. Uh, you don't find us here because as of right, it's below, right? So it's below 10% of people name the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as an issue of interest in the elections um, that we are having next week. So this is also, uh, in our perception, there's a break, there's greater interest, but in reality, when you discuss it with people, and that, by the way, includes other surveys that focus specifically on students, the topic does not break 8% of interest, typically. So, of course, it's interesting to you, it's seven o'clock, you could do a lot of other things, and you are here, so, you know, I care about it, you care about it, but most people, including people immediately around us, are not into that uh, and have not been, right? Okay, so let's talk um, about some of the continuities that I'm seeing, especially since I started uh, working very specifically on this issue of the boundaries of speech about Jews in the year before October 7. So first of all, I am seeing that some of the difficulties that we are having in discussing this issue is that we have rifts within our community in regards to our community, sorry, for this particular purpose is the community of Jews in the United States. Other than that, I'm mostly talking about our community as college campuses, but in this context, I mean the Jewish community in the US is seeing generational rifts around how we think about Israel. And this has been, it's not new. 
it's maybe coming more to the forefront of some people's thoughts and conversations, but it is not new. We have seen these rifts within different communities, particularly more progressive communities in the United States for a number of years. So that's a continuity that we are still dealing with and that affects the way that we think about what people, especially on campus, can permissibly say about Israel. What is offensive or not offensive? What crosses the line? We have rifts within our community in this regard. Another thing that um, is for me a cause for concern is actually those folks outside the 8% of people who prioritize the Israeli-Palestinian conflict or matters related to Israel and Jews as an intellectual, scholarly, or political pursuit. And my worry is related to the naive student who maybe has never met Jews before and uh, shows up on campus not knowing much about anything. And in the context of critique about Israel within different professions, increasingly, is encountering anti-Semitic content. And I know this is a grand claim. I'm happy to back it up if people have questions about it. But my sense is that in some disciplines, well, not my sense, my studies show and other people's studies show that in some disciplines and professions, you can come in not knowing anything about Jews and come out harboring anti-Semitic perceptions. And this is really a unique thing regarding Jews because you will not find other, for blessedly, you will not find other forms of bigotry being propagated by the disciplinary pursuit, by the scholarly pursuit. So I'm far from saying that we cannot find on college campuses um, racism either as an individual, you know, somebody holds racist views or as structural concern or institutional history, etc. But you don't find it in the textbook, right? And so this is uh, something that we do see in regards to anti-Semitism in some contexts. And it's an ongoing concern. It's been a long-term uh, uh, term drift, let's say, in this direction uh, from uh, criticism that is political in nature uh, about Israel um, uh, towards um, perception of Israel and of Jews as one group um, that are anti-Semitic, either in a spirit or in context. Please. Sorry, two questions. Yeah. One is, which disciplines okay. create that anti-Semitism? And the second one is going back to the, the data you showed, and then it's of the 8% of people who consider the israeli palestinian conflict uh, an important issue. Do you know what part of those think that the, that the real issue is the U.S. support of Israel? Right. Okay, great. So the second one, uh, what exactly do they think? We don't know. Because the options that they have, like, okay, what do they think about gun violence pre pre uh, prevention? Do we need more or less of it? Right? We don't know they got a list of topics or areas, policy areas. So I don't know why they care about the Israeli-Palestinian topic uh, um, conflict, but it's a topic that comes up only for 8% of the um, young population in the US. In regards to disciplines and professions, look, um, from reviews of um, uh, from reviews of two different things. One, is, and this is going to come, come up again in the last two more slides, actually, uh, which will be the last slide about solutions. Um, 
Uh, I will talk about it a little bit more, but uh, in terms of professions, we are seeing increased content related specifically to Israel as uniquely evil among all nations. In disciplines, for example, like architectural design, there are courses devoted to that. Um, so I know, uh, surprising, but here we are. Um, there is a significant study on a significant a number of studies on the ethnic studies program, particularly as it is. Um, developed in California. This is very controversial and I don't have time to go into all the details, but I do want to say that um, ethnic studies as an um, academic pursuit is in fact shown to have a lot of positive um, educational uh, outcomes when you uh, invite students or even when you required, a, as California is going to do in two years, unless they change their mind again, um, uh, require it of all high school students, you do see, for example, that fewer of them drop out, right? You see more racial minorities, more immigrants who are sticking through the end of high school and continuing on. So there are po I'm not uh, here to say ethnic studies is a terrible idea as is, but there are strands within the ethnic studies curriculum as the state is, again, postponing its um, adoption, which actually incorporate anti-Semitic, I'm not saying it lightly, anti-Semitic content uh, into the required readings. So, right, so which professions? It's a little bit depend also on the required courses and on who's teaching them, etc. But you find similar things in anthropology and sociology. You find similar things in social work, right? So there are, my concern is, that for a long time, many of us, I definitely knew that because I studied that, but I turned a blind eye to that because I thought, ah, you know, criticism of Israel, criticism of the occupation, these are political stances. Whatever my position would be on any of these, we were talking again about the, the BDS laws, the anti-BDS laws. Whatever my position, in this case I don't support it, but the next person does support it and that's their view and I think that's completely legitimate, right? I mean, I think we can have a fruitful discussion around it. Uh, but I think uh, when you incorporate materials, right, that are actually built on tropes about Jews, on uniquely singling out Israel as evil among, you know, the history of the nations, etc., as not having a right to exist because of these reasons. That's a concern to me. I hope that's an answer. Okay, good. Um, and so we are seeing um, uh, casual and focused anti-Semitic content in all of the ways that I just noted in my answer, so I'm gonna skip that. What can we do? Okay, so I said I have two more slides, even though this is my last question, so that's how I'm cheating. First, I'm gonna say, what can we do? I'm gonna start off by steps that people suggest, which I think are not helpful. And then the next slide is gonna be what I do think is helpful. Okay, so there are, um, there is obviously a lot of attention to this topic right now, and people come up with a lot of solutions to the concern regarding the ways in which Jews are being spoken about, both within the curriculum, in the ways that we just now talked about, and um, in mass protest, in signs. I know you had spray paint here on this campus saying uh, inappropriate things, so, or, or at least unwelcome statements, right? Um, what can we do about it? I don't think it's helpful to pass laws, and I know you have those laws here now. I don't think those are helpful. Laws, pressure from elected officials, getting my president um, to resign uh, after the hearing in Congress, um, uh, significant pressure from uh, uh, university boards, I think all of these folks, the boards, the trustees, the um, 
uh, donors, the elected officials at the local, state, and federal level, they can be engaged. It's, it's a topic that a lot of people care about, but I think when they undermine the freedom of action of academic institutions, and when they try to insert a particular ideological view into the functioning of the university, this is not going to be a good solution. It's not going to work. It's also not a good idea, but it also doesn't work. I don't think more education, people are just not smart enough, they're not educated enough, they're unfamiliar with the topic. If we just teach them more, they will know more and they will not be anti-Semitic. There is actually, well, first of all, it depends on what they will study, as we were just saying. But also, uh, there's actually a very interesting recent study uh, from Brandon Nehan and uh, at uh, Dartmouth and others that looked across a number of democratic states and shows that the level of education that young people have correlates with, bear with me, reduction in anti-Semitism only when the country endorses measures, laws, and policies that reduce anti-Semitism. So in other words, when the overall policy atmosphere does not address anti-Semitism, education doesn't help. Being more educated does not make you less bigoted in this particular regard. It does make you less bigoted in other regards, but not in this regard when the country does not endorse um, counter anti-Semitism policies and measures. So more education in itself is not a good trick. Everyone loves institutional, do you guys like institutional neutrality too these days? Do you have that? Yeah, is this a conversation here? Not yet. Well, lots of universities are, are declaring, we're not saying anything anymore. Right? We're not sending you emails about how we are appalled by this and we are opposed to that and we support this group. We're just not going to say anything anymore. We're going to be neutral. I don't think that's a good solution, but if that's not on the table for you guys, we can skip that uh, diatribe that I have for you. I don't think um, that it will help to continue sitting around the table and trying to uh, reach a definition of anti-Semitism that all of us in this room or that everyone on this campus or that the Jewish community in Atlanta is all gonna agree about. First of all, unlikely, right? But second, unlikely that we will reach a shared agreement. But second, the definition is not going to help us resolve the matter of anti-Semitic um, uh, speech within and beyond the curriculum. Because within the curriculum, we can have content that will be anti-Semitic in nature, but will not cross the line, and that will be a problem. And in, on the quad or you know, in, in the dorms or in conversations, we can have people saying things that are in fact within the definition that we have all nominally agreed on of anti-Semitism, but they just require a conversation. They don't necessarily require, you know, they require clarification. They are a mistake. They are a young person being misguided, right? So I don't think drawing a clear line of anti-Semitism is going to actually fix for us the problem that we are trying to fix, which is that on our campuses, there are a lot of people that are sometimes supporting each other in cultivating anti-Semitic views, right? And so even if they cannot march on campus and say, whatever is the slogan that you least like, let's say that we manage to get them to not say that again, we haven't fixed the problem, right? And so I don't think a definition, I mean, as you can see, the definition that those of you who are in this um, effort, right? The IRA definition, the Nexus definition, the Jerusalem definition, we have a lot of definitions floating around and they haven't fixed it for us yet. That's not their job, right? Drawing the line is gonna be the job of the campus community. 
And so, okay, and I also don't think that we can policy the issue away. Again, if you say, as we have seen, if you say, oh, I'll give you an example. In London, um, they have an ordinance and it's part of a broader law in the UK where you cannot declare your support for terrorist organizations. Right? So you cannot go around, for example, as some people on some campuses do, wearing Hamas uh, insignia. So it's not allowed. So we have a group of people marching around the street in London saying, we support an organization that starts with an age. Okay? So you have a policy which I think, okay, I can see the reason behind this policy but trying to restrict speech through these policies does not fix it either. Okay, so what we can do, as you understand, uh, hopefully from the general tenor of my thoughts, we have our work cut out for us. People who care about preventing and responding to anti-Semitism really need to take the long view and need to create enduring change in light of the fact that we are now seeing a significant uptick in anti-Semitic speech. I'm only just talking about speech. I know we have an uptick in anti-Semitic actions as well, but this is not a part of what I'm trying to fix here. We have to create enduring change. And the enduring change means that we, of course, need clear rules and expectations, right? So I said, don't do detailed policies. We do need general rules that would say, for example, speech that is propagating hate is not welcome here. It doesn't mean that we can censor it or that we should censor it, right? We have First Amendment protections, not on your or my campus, of course, because these are private campuses, but um, uh, we have legal protections. We have the general effort to have an open environment where people can voice their perspectives. But when people propagate hatred, we could say in various ways and express in various ways that it's not welcome. People can um, uh, uh, have consequences to hateful speech even if it's not even if it's protected by law. We can have policies that, that um, uh, require that people adhere by a certain either decorum or a set of boundaries. And um, what I wanna suggest generally is that these boundaries would not simply be boundaries of content, right? So it's not just here are words you can't say or here are um, uh, certain types of sentiments that you cannot express, but instead they would be uh, focused on uh, the speaker, their audience, and the content of speech, right? So we, when we look to consider whether some statement crosses the boundary of permissible speech, we will take into account both the speaker, their audience, and the content of their speech. And then, broadly speaking, we will commit ourselves to the kind of cultural change that, is, um, uh, uh, that would require of us to, for example, take the long and broad view of what we are teaching in different disciplines. After the summer of 2020, a lot of professional associations, departments, and schools have taken it upon themselves to consider what it is that they are teaching and how are they representing black and African American um, uh, materials and people, right, uh, after George Floyd. And that was an effort to try and review are we in some way propagating or uh, inadvertently um, uh, 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 strengthening somebody's misguided, biased, or racist views, right? What can we do to correct what we are teaching people within our school community that, that by omission or by inclusion uh, reflects um, 
racially biased perspectives. I think we need to do similar things in regards to content related to Jews. In the same way that we did that with the higher education sector, did that uh, after women started being admitted more broadly into higher education institutions and it became clear that it's not enough to just let women in, so to speak, right? There is more that needs to be done. Their voices need to be on the syllabus. We also should not harass them. I mean, there's a lot that, you know, that needs to change in an institution in order for it to, have, to make space for women um, uh, fully. And I think even as our community, in this case, again, the Jewish community, is not typically seen as um, a point of concern for efforts uh, in this domain, it should be, right? We do not have in the higher education sector a Jewish diversity concern because there are, um, we are well represented within the higher education sector at the different level as students and faculty. But we have an inclusion concern, right? So these are oftentimes thought of in tandem, <coughs> diversity and inclusion. And in the Jewish context, we do not have a, an issue of uh, diversity, but we do have an issue of inclusion. Okay, I'm gonna tell you one last thing so that I don't end up um, my part here in a depressing uh, way like this, which is that yesterday, uh, as part of my role as the director, the faculty director of the dialogue program, I hosted with a group of students a Jewish Muslim led event uh, called A Year from October. And this was um, coordinated by a group of students, an interfaith group of students that started meeting last year in December. Um, and just to exchange their feelings and views and perspectives. And these were uh, Jewish and Muslim students, on undergraduates on Penn's campus, who had very, very diverse uh, perspectives, backgrounds, commitments. Um, uh, some of the Jews were um, devoted, Zion and are devoted Zionists, others um, are not Zionists or even anti-Zionists. Uh, we had diverse perspectives among the Muslim uh, groups in regards to the conflict as well. And, um, and they uh, wanted to um, illustrate for the campus community that dialogue is possible and that there are more productive ways of expressing disagreement and maintaining our ties than only just marching, right? Than only just demonstrating. And demonstrating, of course, is welcome and possible, but we need to offer additional platforms for students to reflect the ways in which they can connect with each other um, through their differences. And this is really the heart of the change that I think we need to call for. Thank you. So much. Um, we have questions, some of which have actually, I think, already been answered. So that makes me sort of revise what I was going to bring to the floor. So the first question, and please feel free to say not going there or it's too broad. This is the I don't know. Um, as a fellow Penn alum, uh, yeah, I understand that. So this was a question that was submitted, uh, and it dovetails with the fact that you consider yourself, among other things, a political philosopher. So the question was, in consideration of current and recent events, would you rewrite the First Amendment? Wow. <laughs> Would I rewrite the First Amendment? 
Okay, great. Uh, I want to sort of toss this to Whitney, but I will try myself first. Um, the First Amendment, I think, um, was and remains my favorite amendment, so I don't think I would rewrite it. What it gives us around speech is very, very limited, right? abridging the freedom of speech. I mean, basically that's it, right? Congress will make no law abridging the freedom of speech. I mean, we don't have, that's all we have to go on, right? And so really uh, rewriting it would require going into more detail, right? What does it mean to limit somebody's freedom of speech? What does the freedom entail, right? Uh, uh, in the United States, it protects, for example, hate speech, right? Uh, in other countries, we have, like even in Canada, we have specific carve-outs for hate speech, right? Hate speech is not actually protected by the Canadian Charter in the same way that it is protected here um, uh, uh, in this country. So, I don't know that all of this can and should fit into the few words that we have about free speech in the First Amendment because I really favor the notion that we can express broad principles definitely in the Constitution, also uh, more generally in laws and even in the lowly sort of like university handbook or policy, right? When we make rules, I think to make them enduring, they have to be, they have to be broad enough that they don't crumble with the ongoing change that we have in any society. Um, changes in demographics, changes in culture, changes in technology. I mean, I don't know if you had anything about social media, I hope not, but, but we, can, we can talk about that. So the modes of communications are shifting, right? So the way that we talk to each other is really different than we did when the First Amendment was written. So do we need to capture all of this or do we need to say generally, it's really important that people are able to express themselves, right? And that's basically what the First Amendment is telling us. And beyond that, we need to get into the weeds and that we do, you know, uh, using other tools, right? We do it uh, in response to things that seem like, uh, like breaches or maybe that are breaches. So, uh, so my sense is, uh, no, I don't think I would um, recommend rewriting it. I would keep it broad, but I would um, hope that the way the courts are using it uh, would continue to evolve uh, uh, in accounting for current challenges and the current um, norms and expectations in our society. That could have been a curveball, but that was wonderful. Uh, and so here was a question that is related, I think, and I'm not sure, but I believe the questioner was referring to Title VI. But the question was, why are universities not being held accountable to federal law regarding hate speech? And so, First, I would ask, do you believe that that is an accurate statement? And e either way, how would you address that? Right, thank you. So yeah, I suppose this is about Title VI and potentially about Title VII and Title IX as well. Universities, of course, are bound by these, um, uh, by these rules, right? So we do, um, we do have to abide by all federal laws and, and federal, state, etc. laws and requirements. There are some 
not gonna go uh, into that too much. There are some differences between public and private institutions for that purpose. Uh, but broadly speaking, when you think about Title VI, which basically um, forbids um, uh, harassment, uh, pervasive and severe harassment on the basis of ethnic and racial identity, um, universities are required to abide by, by this rule. How exactly it's interpreted, how it is that they have to um, uh, enact their commitment to uh, preventing intimidation and harassment based on uh, ethnic, um, and no, ethnicity, race, and national origins, right? So that's um, sort of like the more difficult category because that's the category that sometimes um, uh, people uh, uh, incorporate and current reading incorporate uh, the Jewish community into. Um, we do have to abide by it. How do we do it? The currently, just a word about that, uh, currently two changes in this domain that I'm aware of, uh, you know, at the, at the top level. One is that a lot of universities are setting up Title VI offices in the same way that we have Title IX offices, right? So Title IX offices are meant to protect gender equity in um, the access to educational programs. And Title VI now, the new um, uh, offices in many universities are trying to protect these other protected groups in the same way. Right, so that's one change that maybe is looking to reflect the concern that the person with the question is voicing. How come you're not doing it? Okay, we are supposed to do it. Let us try doing it a little bit better using this office to the extent that an office is a way to resolve problems. Um, I, I'm not sure that most Title IX offices have proven that this is how you really fix gender equity and access, but um, there is a parallel there. And the other thing that I would say is that the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, in the Department of Education is increasingly interested in this very same question. How come universities are not committed enough by somebody's reading in the OCR to protecting these protected groups, the race, ethnicity, and national origin uh, based groups? And so we are seeing more and more um, complaints in this domain because there are just more cases, I think, around many universities that are related to harassment and intimidation of protected groups based on race, uh, ethnicity, and national origin. Um, it's not obviously new, right? We saw um, upticks over various years. We saw an uptick in Asian uh, harassment and intimidation around the start of COVID and through COVID, right? So, so there are instances where we see upticks and there's an uptick now for sure uh, related both to Jews and to Muslims. And so uh, OCR is trying to get a handle of that by uh, processing more and more of these cases and they do expect universities to do more than they were expected to do before. So I know you were talking about social media, and so we got an interesting question as follows. Uh, it was a reference to Meta, but it could also have been, I imagine, to X. And the questioner asked, Meta has placed from the river to the sea as a non-threatening term, allowing it to be used on its social media platform without ramifications. And so what are your thoughts on this and how it impacts the dialogue on college campuses? I mean, I have to say this is a really hard question it has two difficult parts. One is the phrase itself, and the other is the social media component. The phrase itself, look, 
the phrase itself, I actually think I'm going to bracket and not offer a real answer about. And I, I, I just want to tell you why. Uh, it's not because I'm uh, shying away from it. I am just really grappling with it in ways that are not stable yet. Um, a few years back, a colleague from Temple University, who was also a CNN commentator, used this phrase in a public speech. And so there was a demand from some of the board of trustees at Temple University to get him fired. And I actually, you know, spoke publicly defending him and wrote a little op-ed in the Philadelphia Inquirer, sort of like saying, you can't fire a person for saying this. I understood his intent to be a political statement about the need for a, um, uh, a political solution to the conflict. I did not hear he, his words as saying, Israel should be eliminated or all Israel should, Israelis should vanish or die or, or, or some other more um, aggressive interpretation of this phrase. So I thought it was a legitimate political perspective that I disagree with, but people should be allowed to voice. Since October 7, it does hit differently, right? It just, it just rings in my ears in a different way. And so is that a good enough reason to ban it from Facebook or from my campus? I honestly don't know what to tell you. I think it's not a good enough reason, but if you want me to make the case for that, I don't have it yet. So. Uh, so I don't know. Um, social media, look, um, the regulation of social media is an open issue right now. It also, okay, once more depends on who's going to be the president because we have uh, put two potential administrations with very different views on this matter. Um, but I don't think that uh, listing a specific, as we see with a lot of other words, you make a, a list of words or phrases that are impermissible. So people put little asterisks or they switch one, one letter or they put the number one instead of I. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless, right? When you want to be vile, you're going to be vile, right? And so. I think lists of phrases, it's, it's fine to have them and to have consequences, to put somebody in Twitter jail for a couple of days, you know, if they overstep. Um, it's fine, but it doesn't do a lot of work. Okay, so uh, you kind of uh, took the thunder out of this next question, but I'm going to tweak it a little bit. Uh, the original question was, what are your views on the Chicago statement about the principles of free speech? Now we know. But, yeah, please, mess, mess this up, right? However, um, we know that in many cases, this is something, a tool that administrators use to avoid getting in hot water one way or another, right? But my question, or my elaboration on this question is, for campuses that do follow the Chicago principles or similar statements of neutrality, how do you see this impacting learning communities, which are the heart of what we do in higher ed? Right, great. So both the Chicago principles generally and the Calvern um, a statement on neutrality specifically. Uh, I think they are both, you know, fine ideas. Like I don't think that they are terribly wrong or, 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 or bad. I just think they don't work. So I think the effort, and, and, and they come from a reasonably, okay, so that's where I get everyone else who loves the First Amendment, like I do, to not like me anymore. So here we go. Um, in my view, um, 
the idea of neutrality and the idea of the Chicago principles that basically call for you know, a, a, as many voices as possible to be uh, part of the conversation on campus, uh, as many perspectives as possible. Um, the idea is good, right? So to say everyone should be able to voice their perspective, for sure, yes. That's what a university is for. To say that the administration that's the neutrality principle, that the administration should limit um, its own voice so that other people in the community, faculty and students and different units can voice their perspectives. That's also a good idea. I mean, for the administration to send me fewer emails, <laughs> I'm game, um, right? But. Also, the statements coming from the administration are very unclear. After October 7, just to go straight to the worst you know, instance, after October 7, my university sent out you know, 17 different statements, you know, like yours for sure. And you know, some of what they voiced was, for example, horror from what had happened on October 7. Clearly, not everyone on my campus shared that feeling. Most did, but some people didn't. So what does it mean that the university is horrified? Does it mean that the people who are not horrified should resign or can permissibly be fired because they don't share the same perspective as the administration? Does it mean that protests that voice a different perspective should be you know, shut down? It's unclear what it means that the university has a view. Still, I think neutrality and the effort to say anything goes, all opinions, you know, we don't offer any safety. We invite any and all opinions into the conversation is just not feasible for a learning community, as the question said, right? It's not feasible because of some voices that some people say. So again, as I tried to say before, who speaks really matters. If I'm the teacher and I stand here and I voice a perspective, it carries some weight, right? It carries some weight. It doesn't mean that my students all are gonna agree with me, but it carries some weight in their education. If one of my students says something, for example, expresses some kind of bigotry, and I sort of like chuckle and let it go as the instructor, I have just endorsed it in some way, right? So did, you know, can you make chuckles impermissible? I don't think so. But I think we do need to pay attention to the fact that who speaks and who is their audience is as important as the content of speech, right? And so, um, uh, uh, in my view, to say anything goes, in a way, is an abdication of our responsibility to educate our students. And it's, it's really ignoring the fact that some views that are going to be um, voiced in class, either by the instructor or by um, a student, are going to create the condition whereby some other students are not going to be able to participate. They are not going to have access to the same opportunities to benefit from their education as anyone else, right? And we have seen, of course, many examples to this in the past, definitely about uh, African-American students I mean, we still see that. Um, we saw a lot more of that uh, in the past. So the effort to reduce the prevalence of these perspectives, in my view, is a good thing, right? It's a good thing that students who are members of any group uh, will not feel that they sh don't have the same access to any class because of their group identity. Go ahead. If, if somebody stands in front of the class and, and, and uh, 
voices his opinion about, for example, October 7th. And he, he finds it wonderful that that happened. And, and he thinks that, that Israelis, in, in specific, and Jews in general, uh, don't deserve anything better. His students, and, and he, he, may, he may even act, that, act on those thoughts when he's grading students' papers. But in, in, any, if, in any rate, at any rate, any student in his class will, 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 will feel somewhat um, constrained, let's say, in, in bringing up any, any uh, opinions otherwise to save their, save their well-being in the class. But you can't, you, you just said you can't stop him from doing that in the class. You're saying it matters who says what they say. But oh, yeah. what, what, what can you do about it is the question. Well, uh, if it's the instructor who is speaking in this way, this exactly is at the core of my enduring change that I'm trying to point at. This is... Enduring change? It's happening, but it happens... It's today. happening right now. And look, here is the thing. Uh, in a lot of uh, workplaces, when somebody speaks like that, or even says, you know, other things that are hate-based, right, they can lose their job. Right? If you speak this way to a customer when you are selling them pizza, you will not keep your job. Right? So um, uh, the way that we treat uh, academic work generally and instruction in higher education differently than any other job, you know, has a long history and for the most part, I think, has some good justifications, right? If we want to promote uh, institutions that are, um, you know, advancing knowledge, etc. We have to let heterodox opinions to be voiced. So we know the reasons for why we protect free speech and open inquiry on college campuses. It's overall a good idea. At the same time, uh, when people behave in this way, I think there should be consequences. My whole point was that while we cannot have a list of words that you can cannot say or should not be allowed to say, I think there should be consequences when you are breaching your professional responsibilities for educating all your students in an equitable way. And there is, uh, uh, as you may know, um, uh, a case like this on our campus that was just resolved, although, of course, it will probably continue to make its way through the courts, but um, uh, a case uh, in which a professor who was voicing bigoted um, uh, uh, views in her interactions with her students and was therefore uh, by uh, a, 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 the professional judgment of her uh, superiors and peers have breached her professional responsibilities to include all students in an equitable way uh, in her teaching, right? So the professional norms that create the expectations that you include all your students um, uh, 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 in a way that is based on uh, expectations rather than on identities or other irrelevant things, um, that was breached. And in this case, I think people should have um, uh, the opportunity to explain themselves, etc. People in academia don't get fired from one day to the next. Um, but I think um, it makes sense to demand that this does not happen. Uh, both what you are describing and various other ways of expressing hatred in class. I, I share your frustration that it's uh, not something that happens like this, but the idea is that if we, as, you know, if both uh, uh, people who are experts in uh, Jewish studies and know the history of such things, people who are uh, working in other contexts within higher education institutions um, uh, begin to press the demand or continue to press the demand that these will not be acceptable forms of treating your students, that this too will be a breach of expectations in the same way as, you know, one of my former colleagues who would say, um, 
in the intro class in the engineering school. Oh, look, there are a couple girls in the back, something to look at, right? Um, no, that's not how you behave, right? And there can be consequences to that. And I think uh, same for talking about both Israelis and Jews. All right, we have time for this one last question. And I want to end the same way that Professor Ben Porat ended her talk, which is on a more positive, a more uplifting note. Um, so I put a little preface to this question, and it came from my reading of Cancel Culture, uh, Cancel Wars, your recent book. And in that book, you write about the fact that higher education has two missions. One is a truth-seeking mission, and the other is a civic mission, right? And you talk about how trust and mistrust factor into both of those. So thinking in those terms, this is a question that I know came from one of our students. And the question was, how can we best negotiate the tension between different sides of the conflict while also promoting respectful and engaging or engaged discussion? How does the trust-mistrust work its way in there? Marvelous. So um, the way that I think about these two roles together, the role of uh, seeking truth and the role of cultivating our ability to be members of the same civic political community. The way that I think about it is that um, what we need is to figure out a way to create a network of trust that is ever expanding and that the role of higher education institutions, and actually there's an even bigger role for K-12 schools, but that's besides the point for now. Um, the role of a learning institutions is to create the conditions for our trust networks to expand, right? So in other words, if we are, um, you know, getting our news from different sources. And if we are increasingly um, uh, connecting to people at the interpersonal level who are like us in whatever aspects of our identity are meaningfully significant for us, whether it's ideology or race or religion or anything else, if we are increasingly in enclaves that are, um, make up our trust communities, what universities do is create or uh, offer a platform or a foundation where these uh, communities can in fact, and in many cases must, share the same space and have access to the same knowledge and advance this knowledge together in a way that creates a new informational trust network, right? And I think really the way to overcome even political polarization or the effects of political polarization on American society and other democratic society is through shared context of learning where we can learn to trust um, in the outcomes of our uh, research or studies or um, uh, questioning together, right? Where we can learn to uh, recognize the limitation of our knowledge that we share or the way what we can teach each other. And through these shared learning efforts, which again, what's better than college where you kind of have the time for that, although I know you all are so busy, and um, uh, you have an ongoing um, connection through the full semester or the full four years sometimes, um, uh, if you are students, and you have the opportunity to see how knowledge <coughs> grows and how people contribute to it and how diversity of perspectives is actually an asset for learning more. So in this way, weaving the informational trust networks that we can create 
um, I think uh, can provide a real service that would be both epistemic or knowledge related and civic. And guess what? You're already paid to do that. Uh, if you are faculty, I mean, that's really a part of our everyday work. Uh, uh, what we do in classrooms, both as students and as teachers, is both expand uh, knowledge and um, save democracy. So uh, that's the uplifting note on which I will end. I want to thank our speaker. This was really a wonderful opportunity to air some of the really pressing issues of the day in a very broad context. I want to thank our amazing staff in the TAM Institute who's been working here this evening, Mallory Mibab, Brent Buckley, and Paul Entis. We make this possible. There's a lot that goes into organizing this. And I want to thank all of you because you formed a learning community tonight. You came with your trust. You may or may not have agreed with all of what we heard, but there was true deep listening going on, and that's the start. Thank you.